Sounds good. And then the first question I've got for you is going to be the toughest thing I ask you all day. Can you say and spell your name for me and what I should put for your title? Sure. Michael McDaniel, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, last name M-C, capital D-A-N-I-E-L. Um, professor, Const professor of constitutional law, tenured professor, retired brigadier general, uh, associate dean emeritus. You know, you can use any of them, Justin. Spectacular. That's a lot of freedom. I like it. Um, yeah. WMU? Yes, WMU Cooley. Right, right. So today we're talking about President Biden's federal vaccine mandate. And from the way I see it, please definitely correct me if I'm wrong. There's two things here. One is the federal employee vaccination mandate. The other is this thing for employers with 100 plus people that has not been signed into law yet. What can you tell me about those? Sure. I break it down actually into three. Uh, the first would be federal employees. Uh, and there's no question, the EEOC, the DOJ, uh, federal courts have mandated, have, have clarified uh, and, and supported the fact that you can require federal workers uh, to get the, get the vaccine. That's a true vaccine mandate. They can do that. With federal contractors, that is those who have contracts with some federal agency, uh, that would be the second category, it seems to me. And in that case, uh, it's not a mandate. There's a choice there. You can either continue to accept federal dollars, but as a condition of the contract, you are now going have to you are now going to have to assure that your employees have been vaccinated. And uh, having been in the federal workforce, uh, being at Department of Defense, I can tell you, uh, we had contract employees uh, that were interspersed, intermingled, right with uh, my own workforce. Um, so to protect the federal workforce, you have to you have to also require vaccinations for the federal contract employees that are there. And then the third category, as you say, is for uh, employers who have 100 or more employees, and that's a that's a specific term defined in under OSHA regulations uh, in terms of having full regulations. Uh, and again, that is not a mandate either, because it specifically says that they can either require their employees to be vaccinated or they can require them to have weekly uh, tests. And if there's a positive test, then, of course, they've got to they've got to take further steps. So an employee could have a, take a test every week. So it's not a, truly a mandate now. The legality of mandates, even those, even though these really aren't mandates, the legality of mandates for private employers is what seems to have everybody, uh, uh, you know, up in arms or in discussion uh, these days. And I think it's worth having a debate over that. But the, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1905, a case called Jacobson versus Massachusetts, specifically said it was a it was a pastor, uh, a minister, uh, I forget what religion. And he uh, declined to get vaccinated for smallpox in, in 1901, 1902, when there was a smallpox uh, uh, epidemic going through the New England states. And he said it was based upon his own personal liberties. Uh, the Supreme Court absolutely disagreed in the seven to two vote. And they specifically said, and I'll read you the language if I may. It said that uh, under the principles of self-defense, of paramount necessity, a community has the right to protect itself against an epidemic of disease which threatens the safety of its members. And that was very striking to me, that, that idea. It's not just paramount necessity, which means the government has a compelling interest uh, in assuring this, which clearly they do, but also that he framed it as a matter of self-defense. Even you know, 120 some years ago, uh, the, the court recognized that we have to defend against bacteriological or virological uh, uh, enemies just as well as our common enemies as we would have thought of back then, you know, right prior to, to World War I, uh, and called it a matter of self-defense. So uh, that case was followed in, by a case from in the Supreme Court in 1922 called Zucht, Zucht versus King. And that was contesting compulsory uh, uh, vaccines again, but for school children. And in that case, uh, the court spoke in much broader language. And the court said, it is, quote, settled after Jacobson 
that it is within the police power of a state to provide for a compulsory vaccination. Again, really broad language. And if you think about it, we have had compulsory school vaccinations for somewhere between five and 10 different vaccines, depending on whether or not you the measles, the MMR, measles, rubella one, and then the, the diphtheria pertussis tetanus one, which are you know single vaccines, along with all the others that are required, uh, meningococcal, uh, hepatitis is sometimes required, whether all of those uh, have been required for some time. And so it's there is an issue. What the court is saying is there is an issue of individual choice, of individual personal liberty, but that issue can be overridden it can be trumped, if you'll pardon the expression, by the the public's need to preserve the public health and safety, to, to, to protect all of us. So we're not allowing the personal liberties of one individual um, to interfere or override the collective uh, uh, interests uh, of, of, of the public, of the community. And that's exactly what the court has said for over 100 years. Uh, I guess the other issue I'd bring up while I'm thinking about it is, you know, OSHA has uh, broad ability uh, over uh, conditions in the workplace to assure that they're safe uh, working conditions. And I, I you know, if there's going to be any debate, it's going to be whether or not this is truly a workplace hazard. Uh, and I have to think that it is. Uh, I can see how some people are going to make an argument it's not truly a workplace hazard. But if, if you uh, want to have individuals come to work, then you can certainly require the vaccine to do so. Uh, and so uh, I, I realize there's some issues there, uh, but first, it's not a mandate and mandates have been held constitutional. And secondly, uh, the, the, to the degree there's going to be a debate about whether this is truly in the workplace, I think the employers, should they choose to challenge this, I think the employers would, would lose on this one. And the reason I say should they choose to challenge it is because it seems to me that um, if you're an employer, uh, especially in a, a large employer, over 100 employees, uh, and you've got a choice between assuring all your employees are vaccinated and assuring that you go through this logist logistical and procedural nightmare of assuring all employees are, are tested weekly and have a negative test and report that test through the system, I think you're gonna to say to, to your employees, I'm, I'm sorry, we gotta do this, but the federal government insists and the best way to do it is, uh, uh, is to have a vaccine. The last, the last issue I would think that comes to mind anyway, I'm sure you have some, but the last issue I can think of is, well, what about the employees? Would they have the ability to challenge this? And the answer is no. Uh, you know, Michigan's an at-will employer state, so uh, your em employer can terminate you for any cause they choose, and failure to get a vaccine would probably be a pretty good choice, uh, you know, a good reason to, to, to say we're terminating you because we're, again, following what the CDC and now OSHA says about workplace safety. Uh, so. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, you, you could bargain for it as a union, by, your union could bargain for it in some conditions, in some circumstances, I mean. Uh, but I don't think that an individual employee is going to have, uh, otherwise have a, a way to challenge this. Is that choice of, you can say, I'm not going to get vaccinated, but I'll get tested every week. Is that the biggest thing to make sure that there is an ironclad defense if this does get challenged? Uh, I wouldn't say it's the biggest. Uh, again, I think the Supreme Court decisions that I gave you, the Jacobson versus Massachusetts and Zucks versus King uh, cases, which specifically gave uh, a, a government the, the right to vaccinate, even compulsory vaccination, I think will be the strongest. Um, I would also say uh, that I think it works better here I think it's a stronger case here where we can show the track record of the hundreds of thousands of individuals who've gotten uh, gotten sick and over 670,000 Americans that have died from this from this pandemic from this virus. Uh, you know, and it was some with some types uh, of vaccinations, it might be more um, that only affect a certain population or segment of the population. 
uh, it might be more debatable. But in this case, considering what we've seen and the four, I think, different surges now of the coronavirus um, and the different variants, I, I, I think there's a very strong case to say that you can have compulsory uh, vaccination. And again, uh, the federal government, the president did not say that. What they said is you, the employer, have a choice to do one or the other. So it seems like this is constitutional. Anyone who's saying this goes against the the laws of America doesn't really have a leg to stand on, at least not in the courts. No, I, I think I think it should be emphasized. You're absolutely correct. It should be emphasized. This is constitutional. So to break it down as a con law professor, here's what I'd say. Does the individual have a, a personal liberty interest here? Absolutely. There is clearly a personal liberty interest not to be touched, if you will. Uh, and there's been a number of cases involving, uh, you know, um, different uh, incidents by where the where the government is requiring something to be done to the individual physically, and that's been declared to be a personal liberty interest of the individual. So the the people who protest this are correct that there is a personal liberty interest, but where there is a personal liberty interest, then the government has to demonstrate that there's a compelling state interest that they have a really really good reason why we have to vaccinate, and in this case, I think we do, and that really good reason reason is um, that we have to protect the, the public health, you know, and again, that's why I was saying 670,000 or so dead, hundreds of thousands more who have taken sick, uh, the effect upon the economy on productivity in, in the workplace, and then on the economy itself, as well as the public health itself, there's compelling government interests here that will override, that can be demonstrated, that will override that uh, that personal liberty interest in not being uh, un, un, having this involuntary, unwanted touching uh, to break it down to a constitutional level uh, by a government entity, which which this this would be. Uh, and then the only question is, is this the best alternative, which the state would also, in this case, the federal government would also have to demonstrate. And I think uh, the federal government, by saying you have two choices here, uh, you can either do weekly testing uh, or you can have the vaccination. I think because they're giving it a choice, I think they'll survive on, on sort of that prong of the test. So yes, it is a personal liberty interest, but the government has a compelling reason and has come up with a narrowly tailored remedy uh, to assure that that personal liberty interest is not infringed any more than necessary. Those are all the questions that I have. You have answered every single thing I was going to ask you before I said it. Um, anything Great. else you want to add? Nope. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I would just point out, you know, that uh, we're only talking 25% of the population or so, you know, there are at least 70% of the population has received one vaccination, 65% of the vac of the population over the age of 18 have, has, is fully vaccinated. Um, you know, so we're not that far from herd immunity. And if we treat this uh, vaccination like we've treated other vaccinations throughout history, then we would be we would be done with this, and we'd be over this. You know, historically, uh, I'm struck by the fact that um, you know the first vaccination that was required was for smallpox, and General George Washington worried about the Continental Army. You know, in the winter, you know, they're camping at Valley Forge and whatever, and he mandated that all new recruits had to have a smallpox vaccine. And it was pretty crude back then, you know, they scratched the skin and they, they stuck the live virus under the skin to build up your own antibodies. Benjamin Franklin's son died of smallpox, so he started a fund uh, to, to assure that everybody could get the vaccination that wanted to. So this goes back to the founding of our country we've, where we've had uh, um, vaccinations that have been mandated for certain uh, portions of the population. And we're doing the same thing here today. And as I've said, we've done it all through our history uh, with members of the military. You know, when I went overseas in the military, I remember standing in line and getting shot in both arms at the same time for yellow fever and anthrax and um, malaria, and I don't know what else. I don't, I don't think they ever told us. And we said, yes, sir, can I have another? You know, so it has been throughout our, it has been throughout our history that we've had compulsory vaccinations. And this one isn't even that. So there's no real legal defense here. Well, Professor, I really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and stop my recording there.